Hello, and welcome to BigBookCTK.com. My name is Tussie, and I'm reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 5. Oliver mingles with new associates. Going to a funeral for the first time, he forms an unfavorable notion of his master's business. Oliver, being left to himself in the undertaker's shop, set the lamp down on a workman's bench and gazed timidly about him with a feeling of awe and dread, which many people a good deal older than he will be at no loss to understand. An unfinished coffin on black trestles which stood in the middle of the shop looked so gloomy and death-like that a cold tremble came over him every time his eyes wandered in the direction of the dismal object from which he almost expected to see some frightful form slowly rear its head to drive him mad with terror. Against the wall were ranged, in regular array, a long row of elm boards, cut in the same shape, looking in the dim light like high-shouldered ghosts, with their hands in their breeches pockets. Coffin plates, elm chips, bright-headed nails, and shreds of black cloth lay scattered on the floor. And the wall behind the counter was ornamented with a lively representation of two mutes in very stiff neckcloth, on duty at a large private door, with a hearse drawn by four black steeds approaching in the distance. The shop was closed and hot. The atmosphere seemed tainted with a smell of coffins. The recess beneath the counter in which his flock mattress was thrust looked like a grave. Nor were these the only dismal feelings which depressed Oliver. He was alone in a strange place, and we all know how chilled and desolate the best of us will sometimes feel in such a situation. The boy had no friends to care for or to care for him. The regret of no recent separation was fresh in his mind. The absence of no loved and well-remembered faith sank heavily into his heart. But his heart was heavy, notwithstanding, and he wished, as he crept into his narrow bed, that that were his coffin, and that he could be lain in a calm and rest and lasting sleep in the churchyard ground with a tall grass waving gently above his head, and the sound of the old deep bell to soothe him in his sleep. Oliver was awakened in the morning by a loud kicking at the outside of the shop door, which, before he could huddle on his clothes, was repeated in an angry and impetuous manner about twenty-five times. When he began to undo the chain, the legs desisted, and a voice began. Open the door, will ya? cried the voice, which belonged to the leg, which had kicked at the door. I will, directly, sir, replied Oliver, undoing the chain and turning the key. I suppose you're the new boy, ain't ya? said the voice through the keyhole. Yes, sir, replied Oliver. How old are ya? inquired the voice. Ten, sir, replied Oliver. Then I'll rock you when I get in, said the voice. You just see if I don't. That's all. My work is back. And having made this obliging promise, the voice began to whistle. Oliver had been too often subjected to the process to which the very expressive monosyllable just recorded bears reference to entertain the smallest doubt that the owner of the voice, whoever he might be, would redeem his pledge most honorably. He drew back the dots with a tr- drew back the bolt with a trembling hand and opened the door. For a second or two, Oliver glanced up the street and down the street and over the way, impressed with the belief that the unknown who had addressed him through the keyhole had walked a few paces off to warm himself, for nobody did he see but a big charity boy sitting on a post in front of the house, eating a slice of bread and butter which he cut into wedges the size of his mouth with a clasp knife and then consumed with great dexterity. 
Thank you very much for watching. You've been listening to Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. My name is Tosi, and this is BigBookCTK.com. Thank you very much, and bye for now.